give some meditation instruction, like pith instruction style, rather than just overall lecture. Is that all right? No. So, um, it's actually helpful to uh, recite the meditations and texts out loud. Um, that uh, when we're hearing others and we're hearing our voice kind of harmonize with others. So there's, there's actually some benefit neurologically doing that. It's also, it seems interesting to hear other people too, but there's sometimes pause here like, oh, that's interesting. And then, then, then join in. The reason for doing them um, spoken is also uh, when the texts are uh, spoken, they're more likely to be memorized, and then the uh, words will come back to you at the right time. So if you combine awareness meditations, um, you know, Vipassana, Mahavipassana, Mahamudra Dzogchen, and you've had the textual background in the memorization, it's interesting the um, the right word or phrase will come back as a living word to you, like that, you see. So that's why I said when we're reading texts, even when we're doing, um, you know, scholarly study, um, you, you want to read it like you're reading an alive love poem, or you want to read it like you're reading um, some, uh, maybe very carefully, like a legal text or something. <laughs> you know, it's like, read your contract. Um, who's the rock star that's, you know, in the contract said, uh, you know, I have to have, um, you know, brown uh, or M&Ms, you know, in my hotel room. Is that apocryphal? I don't know. But if they weren't there, you'd know the people hadn't read the contract, right? So, so the, when we're reading and we're reading out loud, um, a lot of times people think, oh, I don't do prayers, uh, I don't do that, you know, I just do awareness. But um, when, when the right word is there, the mind will pick it out and it will become alive for you. That's why uh, we also like at um, uh, the expressions event that we do oh, once a month, every Friday, um, we, we have poets, right? Um, and that's why we have a poetry wall. If you walk back through, which I'm sure you will, you'll see the poetry wall, right? <clears throat> so, um, you know, reciting together and memorizing and poetry, and then last of all, like singing together, uh, like kirtan is extremely important. Um, because then uh, the, the sound and the rhythm uh, will, will bring up um, more coordination and integration in your meditation. So if we want to do to highest yoga tantra or um, Mahamudra's of Chen practice, then we're, we're here to integrate our experience properly, aren't we? Yeah, um, so that's that's why we we try to have a full meal. So to use a meal metaphor, like we 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 do like various different courses, and we like maybe different food on the plate, and but we want to taste each one separately and kind of integrated at the same time. I happen to live with a foodie, and it's just. A foodie family, and it's interesting how to talk about food because didn't grow up this way. Food was just like I don't know energy; you just ate it, and you know. So people talk like, "Yeah, after I have a little bit of the spice, and then I eat the salmon, I notice the transition in my tongue between this and that, and that's totally cool, right? Or you know, let's let's add a little bit more of this next time to." The beans, because when you combine that with the sweet potato, you you know like that. That's the deal. You know, I didn't grow up that way. It's just like here's your hot dog and the baked beans, and 
So uh, that's a tantric perspective because then we see the, the range of experience and we're integrating the senses with the wisdom of interdependence, right? Without blurring distinctions, we see the um, connection, correct? So, you know, we're, we're doing these, uh, I call them narrative meditations, spoken meditations. We call them prayers, but they're really narrative meditations, particularly during uh, the Heart Sutra. So um, with when our meditation practices, um, uh, we have to combine the speech aspect, not just, you know, mind or just body. We need to combine the speech aspect at least at least do um, for those people that are coming to the Dzogchen retreat at the end of the month, at least, you know, do three ahs or something, right? Ah. Oh. That's that's when you finally sit down in your chair at the end of the day, right? Or something, <laughs> you know. Uh, and then um, that's when somebody greets you or something. Hi. Oh. That's when your mind is liberated, right? Do three us. Don't try it. Just like, ah, oh. ah, oh. ah. Oh. Oh. Sometimes uh, people, you know, lots of times I'll greet you with like, oh my home, right? So what's that called? Who's who's the scholar? If you just say oh my hung, oh my hung, oh my hung, oh my hung, or you hold it with your breath and you add the colors to it, what's that called? Yeah, that's a good start. Yeah. Raja recitation, right? Yeah. Body, speech, and mind. Oh my hung. Oh my hung. Oh my hung. Mm. And who says ah la la a lot? Allah. I do. Allah. <laughs> Sometimes you know, I should be saying, you know, that's like Rajapani. A lot of, lot of, you know, soka things are a lot of different Buddhists go, Allah, you know. <clears throat> Those sound kind of like inshallah, you know, Allah. So the speech aspect is enormously important. Um, that's the main activity of the Buddha is his speech. Um, but, uh, we have a weekend coming up. Um, the other aspect that's really important for meditation is your the sense of place, your mandala. So of course, when we're up at Lotus View, it's beautiful, but we still set the mandala, right? We still set it up in a certain way to remind ourselves of sacredness. So I'm hoping that most people on that are in the room here and listening have some kind of um, home altar or meditation room, something like that. <laughs> It's enormously difficult to do Rajana visualizations, even of the Kriya Yoga type, just like single Chanresi or Tara. If you don't have any Tankas or Tara Rupas around, you know, it's people go, it's, I have a hard time visualizing. I can't do it. And um, I said, Well, can you visualize your kitchen? They go, Yeah. <laughs> And then my other favorite is the Golden Gate Bridge. Can you just like Golden Gate Bridge? Yeah. Or Santa Claus or, you know, whatever. So it's because it's really familiar. So if we take a very strange looking Buddha, you know, even just a normal looking Buddha and try to visualize it when we're not familiarizing ourselves with it in a kind of everyday way, then it's, then we're going to strain in a visualization, aren't we? So that's another reason why we have these tankas and this Shakyamuni statue. So it just becomes familiar, not in a tune out way, but like, you know, say then you can you can pull it up right away, right? 
otherwise, if you've never seen anything, it's it's a little bit harder. <clears throat> that just makes sense, right? So you don't need a complicated home altar, but um, this maybe a Buddha and candle, flowers. You know, I don't want people tripping out and then having water bowl wars. Do I need to say what water bowl wars are? Water bowl wars are um, what happens when people um, start arguing about uh, how much water should be in the offering bowls or how big they should be or how closely should they be like a rice, you know, a piece of rice, you know, and then how how much, like if you go to the trouble of putting saffron in it, how much the saffron should be. And then, like you make the saffron water, and then what do you do with it? Is it refrigerated, or do you leave it out? <laughs> those, are, those are water ball wars, you know, like Star Wars, Clone Wars. So, even though we're having familiar images um, that help us bring forth the right image at the right moment, that's what I call a Kala Chakra, the right place, the right time, right? Don't we all want to be in Kalapa Court? I do want to be in Kalapa Court, right place, right time. So, when we have the images, uh, physically, then they'll come up at the right time. But if you have the idea that I've got to get the, you know, water bowl just right, then what will come up when you you need an image is, I don't know whether I'm doing it just right or not. When it, when it becomes familiar, then you don't have to think about doing it just right because you've got it. This is huge. That's why we have this set up. So you can go, oh, okay, I know. It's very familiar. There's Tara, there's Chenrezig, there's Kala Chakra, family, right? Familiar. I think that's easy. Um, so when we're preparing to do um, uh, Mahamudras of Chen practice, um, uh, we're not preparing to have a special experience. When you're doing Mahamudras of Chen practice, you are not trying to prepare to have a special experience. Shall I say it again? <laughs> Oh, I know you are. So you're now preparing to have a special experience. Because we think, you know, one way of looking at the path is you do all this kind of nundro and foundation work, textual study, ritual stuff, talks, talks, talks. And then, you know, if you do it just right, you'll have this special experience, right? That's completely crazy. But I never think that way. So yeah, in a way, like I love you all. I mean, because I know, but um, you're not preparing to have special experience. So we can test ourselves if you're going. We're not preparing to have a special experience, and we think, well, then why the f are we doing it? Then we know we have a grasping mind, right? We we're excited, aren't we? We want we want something like that. Why then go on? Why go on a Mahamudra or a Dzogchen retreat, even if it's just a weekend? What, you know, if we're not having a special experience. What, what are we going to have? Pardon me. Something's going to happen. Well, this is good. I love these spontaneous, that fun. Okay, I, 
need to get out the whiteboard. Okay, fun, experience, uh, what else? We what? We got beef and beer sauce, okay, yeah. But what if actually there were no wrong answers? No, so I can just go, okay. Uh, anybody else? Pardon me to learn? Sure, absolutely, yeah. Ordinary mind, yeah. And Okay, yeah, good. Being present, yeah. Let go. Can you get another better one? Not another one, yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Truth. So when we go to the retreat, the uh, from, or if we say we're doing kind of Patrick Mahamudra and, and Subchen, you, you want to say we're, we're bringing all of you to the retreat, you see? You, you want to bring all of it. Okay. All of it. Yeah. That's actually more difficult than attaining things, right? It's easier to kind of like attain something like something new, right? Like, okay, stepwise you have to do and then like that. But um there's a little different kind of flip with um RT teachings, like you just bring all of it. So same way we have bodhicitta, like uh we everyone's included. So radical, right? Like somebody, you know, it's like, do we really want, you know, you have to think, do, do you really want everybody included in the mandala? Do you want everyone to be happy and free? Do you, do you really want to include all, everything? Don't you want to leave something behind when you go on retreat? And what do you do? So there's that side of retreat where we're saying, okay, we're, leaving something behind. Um, for me, it's my really good bed, but I'm staying at a bed. <laughs> so I'm not totally leaving that behind, but we have to flip it. I'm trying to say, you know, you, you actually want to bring everything with you, right? So that's why we do the prayers and we think about things, we visualize things, all the senses come with us. We're not leaving anything behind. What did the Buddha think about Jesus? What does the Buddhist think about Jesus? Um, I don't know. What do you, I mean, what do you think about Jesus? Sure. I think so. Give it a try. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's nice to hear. So I hope we get a good turnout for the retreat because um, people know um, be moving the end of this summer, and of course coming down regularly, but um, uh, I just want to put that a little bit of impermanence into the to the mix. So I'm bringing I'm bringing that in to the model a little bit of. Sometimes when I do in the Chen Mahamudra, we in completion, we call it great completion or great seal. We think by bringing everything in. Um, we're leaving out impermanence, right? 
um, if we're thinking that the mind or recognition or primordial awareness or rigpa or whatever is static, then I have to remind you, we have to bring in impermanence, right? One of the last, um, one of the last times I saw um, Chakrat Ramesh in, in uh, uh, Nevada City before he was um, moving up north to Cottage Grove area. He built a really, um, I don't know if people know, but in, on um, Paul and Nancy Clemens land, he uh, constructed this um, incredible uh, gurimshe out of um, concrete, actually, and coming out of a lotus pool, and um, it's really magnificent. So I thought his last teaching would be something like some, something what I consider to be high teaching, right? But what, you know, what did he give a teaching on? So I, he actually said, so he's kind of funny, so I'm going to give a really high teaching today. What do you think he taught on? Like, be kind and impermanence. <laughs> yeah, Dzogchen, of course, right? Totally. Yeah, it's really magnificent. <clears throat> so for the retreat, we, we want to bring everything. If you don't bring everything, then um, it wouldn't be complete, would it? Mm. So we we do want to bring our our idiocy and delusions with us, don't we? Yeah. Okay. The other thing I want to mention is that um, um, I'll be putting together some requirements for um, people to be what I'm calling facilitators or practice leaders. And um, then finally people that uh, want to be um, meditation instructors that um, they're not going to be very meditation. They're not going to be very many meditation instructors. It's too difficult. So that's what I'm just putting it there. So, and I'll have to appoint them and then, and then hassle them for the rest of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, yeah, so um, I think it's a pretty low bar, you know, I'm saying, well, you have to do 24 minutes of shamatha a day, which this is nothing, okay, but you know, terms of means continuous, not in one sitting, you know, <clears throat> plus all your other commitments, tantric commitments or practice commitments, whatever, plus you have to relate with me and your teachers. You got to get feedback. There can't be any Lone Ranger <laughs> meditation instructors. You have to actually do some study, you know. Yeah, you, I mean, you have, you have to know the, the basics, right? Can't say, I'm teaching meditation, but I don't know Eightfold path, something like that. I'm suggesting I go back with refuge to having people do an essay, and I, I'm going to do that. And um, see, I'm tightening up as I leave, right? And uh, when there are a few people, maybe um, maybe they're listening um, through uh, Zoom today, where when I'm doing refuge, I'd, I'd say, please recite what the what are, what are the eight of the Eightfold Path? You know, put you on the spot, right? Some people remember those days, right? Like, you have a little coaching one. Yeah, that's okay. But, you know, like that. Like, you got you to gotta know it on the spot. 
and you bring up everything, everything you need right on the spot, right? There's no other way to do it. That's, you know, you can't. So maybe it's um, basically uh, ninth um, Kamapa's um, poem on Mahamudra, very nice, right? You can't say, you can't say it's this or that, right? You just have to bring up the whole thing all at once. Can't, can't make anything up. That's hard, isn't it? Like, let's ask my teacher, what's, you know, young, you know, you ask these questions, like, it's my mother, don't make anything. That's really difficult, right? Because the minute somebody says that, you you, you want to make something up, right? Don't we? We do. Yeah. But if you brought everything with you, then you don't have to make anything up. Isn't that easy? You don't have to start thinking, well, it's this and not that. We need that pajna with part of the path, don't we? There's times when you say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I want to do this activity. That's beneficial. I'm not going to do that. Harmful. But if you're doing the, the Mahamudra practice, subtim practice, then it, it's just all comes together. You don't have it. There's no time to say, yeah, well, it's this and not that. Or can I show that part? But I don't want you to look at that part. Is that correct? Am I saying anything outside the lineage, right? We have some Mahamudras of 10 people. Am I making anything up? No? Anybody? No. Now's your chance. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have time. You don't, you don't have time to say this, this or that. You, just, you get to make your presentation. <clears throat> so with meditation instructors, they have to have that kind of integrity, like... <clears throat> That's their day, you know, I had to go to the news. That was like, when I was at my, like, my Tibetan was totally useless. Um, but they'd make me go to these debate sessions. And then, <laughs> like, they'd say, okay, we got to say something. You know, everyone's looking at you. Like, I have no idea what they're talking about. In general, I mean, they're, you know, they're doing, they're debating something from, you know, Prajna Paramita, you know, but I have no idea what they're talking about. So, um, you know, you, you just, but you just have to say something, you see. So eventually, yeah, I just would, I would say something and then they would move on. It was great. <laughs> it was idiotic, probably, like, yes, no doesn't follow, it's, you know, it's pervasive or something like that, you know, if, but you just say something, right? One of my teachers who's passed away in Zen, Ikin Roshi, used to just say, come on, just press any button, any button works. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. So meditation instructors and have to do study, practice, darshan, show up to groups, be friendly, have social skills, have the ability to, to relate with different people's Buddha natures and qualities. Mm -hmm. Difficult, right? Yeah, like, I don't know, years maybe. Yeah. No, not for this retreat. But it, we're meditation, where I'm going with this talk, it's, we're meditation instructors for ourselves, aren't we? Yeah. So, if you have a practice schedule and you're developing refuge in bodhicitta, if you're keeping the samaya vows, you're doing lots of sitting, and you're, you're getting feedback from qualified teachers, and you'll progress, right? You're getting enough support and enough challenge. There's a balance there, right? So even if you don't 
become like an objective meditation instructor, which there'll be few. We need to be meditation instructors for ourselves, right? Because um, I, it's kind of grim, but I always think I have to practice as if I was kidnapped, you know, and I don't have any sangha or teachers anymore, no text. I'm just falling out of the airplane you know, <laughs> in the jungle. And can you practice like that? Like right now, would you have enough right now? You'd be your own, your own instructor, right? Totally alone. Desert, captured by terrorists, you know, your your lovers left you, you've got a divorce, you're sitting alone in your apartment. What are you gonna do, right? So Trung Pramshi is famous for saying, the real practice is what you do and no one's looking. Our meditation instructors need to follow the precepts also. So that means the five basic precepts, and that's hard to do, isn't it? What's what's the hardest one? Everyone should. That's the one I always forget, right? So we have to work with that. We have to work with our character and behavior. That's a big part of uh, Mahamudra and Dzogchen training too. Is is like your activity and your conduct. So it doesn't mean being wild or out of control or being. Nifty, we're really looking at our conduct, aren't we? Or, you know, Zogchen puts out there, and you know, it's all about conduct. Isn't that so? I want to pause for some questions and comments before we end today. Usually we hand out the microphone now. We haven't been doing that. And Dylan's being really nice as usual. Hello. Make sure you speak into it like this because it only picks up your voice when you're eating it. Um, what other kinds of meditations did you do at CRJ and along with the teaching? The with the two monks kind of, it's almost a beautiful dance to see how that happens. I, I think Joe's asking that debate quality. Um, you know, I just, I had a lot of time to do my individual practice. Like that, yeah. Just everything you're doing, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I have a question about how do we uh, bring our distractions with us to retreat or to our Dzogchen Mahamudra practice um, and not get attached to them? How do we balance that? So, of course, we're bringing them with us like our shadow, right? You can't, you have to include them, right? So, um, the 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 quick answer, the most difficult answer, is um, we we totally love them, not in indulging, but you know, like you love them so much that they they at uh, the grasping or the um, clinging aspect of distractions or the anger is transformed, right? So uh, in our tradition, we're after what we call you know wisdom love. Because when you really love someone, you see them exactly as they are. And then seeing them exactly as they are, they can see themselves exactly as they are, that potential exists. So then the, um, the unbalance goes away, you see. So it's, it's very strange. But um, we're doing Dzogchen and Mahamudra. Um, we're not... We still can do regular antidotes, of course, you know, and mindfulness and so forth. But um, uh, you, you want you want to bring your distractions right up here, right in front of you. Um, 
and you know we we kind of uh it's a little bit surround them with love and um and um kind of so Chen should style you're you're eating them right you know you're just you're willing to ingest them like that you know so that's kind of make these sounds a little bit abstract but um they become fuel your hand is still up for some reason oh okay okay if we're doing 24 minutes of shamatha is that on top of mahamudra and what is the relationship to doing shamatha and mahamudra together okay so comes to the title it's really important to just the do the the very simple but profound shamatha practice where all you're doing is just staying with your your designated object because we we always want to flavor things you know we always want to add you know just well so recently I've called like chamata is like just distilled water. It has no taste. So if if we're drinking water for the taste, you know, rather than just water to, you know, because we've been out in the desert and we're just thirsty, then we're adding something to it. So I there's a profound um, connection between this most difficult and basic practice, shamatha, and and mahamudra, because um, we're not trying to add anything. What we're doing in Dzogchen mahamudra is we're we're recognizing what's there in a profound way, but we're not we're not trying to alter it. In shamatha, we're we're postulating or or or, you know, saying this is going to be there, you know, like the breath or an image or a mantra or even mind itself. So it has an intentionality and it has a bit of effort to it, right? But um, we're, we're, we're adjusting it, of course. But uh, we, we have to get totally bored with our trips. So I tend to agree with... <laughs> Uh, Pema Chodin, like if you have trouble sitting for half an hour, you need to sit for an hour or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, or the reason they're very strong without very strong concentration, um, you know. So, unlike some of the people here, you know, not everybody's gotten close to their teachers or Tibetan teachers. I've gotten really close and, you know, and, uh, so what's the biggest problem? You know, what's what's the biggest problem? You know, when I'm talking to, you know, Dharma chat or something, um, it's Westerners impatience, right? And unwillingness to do the concentration practices. We we just want to kind of get it, you know. You know, like give it so I get it, you know, I get the joke right away. So, you know, we we don't want to do the I mean we don't have to do nundro practices, and, you know, and 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 kind of you don't want to do the boring practices of memorization or repetition. But um, in in India, the yogis um, preceding the Buddha, of course, you know, understood that repetition um, wins. You just freaking wear the delusion out. Okay, you don't. You know, so when there finally is a realization, it's kind of an embarrassment. Oh, yeah, should have known this. <laughs> you know, you don't go on running around. I'm just speaking around. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, yeah. There's <laughs> many times, right? You know. Yeah, so there's humbleness, right? There's humility, right? You know, just nothing. So that's the other weird part. Realization doesn't add anything. 
doesn't subtract anything. So there's no attainment, no non-attainment. We're not adding. We're not adding anything to it. So it's just distilled water. Now you get, you get a third question out of this. Is that fair? Well, no one gave me the mic, so. <laughs> but I have another question. Unless someone else does, I'm. I'm I hope there's one more person, so we're not excluding anybody. No, you're stuck with me. Um, does Zoom have any questions? Don't know if it's the Zoom world. No, they're all looking friendly. Even Dirk's cat is looking friendly. <laughs> um, so Lama, if you yeah. do have trouble sitting for shamatha for twenty-four minutes, where do they start? Do they start at one minute, thirty seconds, two minutes, six minutes? How do we actually develop that concentration so it's beneficial rather than just suppressing or repressing or stuffing or something else? Everyone has a different personality. You know, traditional Tibetan styles actually you know, kind of start short and then when the mind gets tired or something, then, um, you know, you take a little break, then come back. So you maintain that freshness. Um, my comment on that, the problem with that is that then that, that kind of rewards uh, a certain style of meditation so that you're always kind of watching in a certain way. Um, so... Uh, I I had the really fortunate um, karma to train with uh, Trung Perm Shea. So you didn't know how long the meditations were. So, I mean, you can literally be sitting there for an hour or just sitting there for 10 minutes. So I still, in a way, think that's the best. Very few people want to hear that, but you know, so, but um, in in general, uh, for dedicated people, you, you you want to. I would suggest. I do suggest, like, you know, sit, sitting sitting long enough until you notice your attention and your body chit is beginning to degrade. Um, but don't quit there. Um, and and game. um then you know add more what you need to more you know keep going beyond that so i i wouldn't say it's quite it's it's not quite an it's it's a little bit different than just just applying an antidote it's um it's digging a little deeper so let's say you're like 500 feet from the summit and you know so you're not resting right there you're you're going well I'm only 500 feet from the summit so I'm going to keep walking a little bit more so you're digging a little bit deeper but it's also it depends upon the person then you might say well you know I'm just I should take a break right now because my feet are bleeding so I'm going to pull over so that's why we need a teacher because you know sometimes you know, we need somebody to say, you know, you could, you could go a little longer, you could do a couple more push-ups. You know, you have it in you. So it really depends upon the person and the teacher. But um, um, but it's uh, it's very um, academic style. Is you know everything's set up and the the lectures are. Um, very organized, unlike this one, but this one is um, the Dzogchen style is we want to cover the whole territory, so it's like a labyrinth. So instead of just, you know, step-by-step -step long room style, it's more like a labyrinth. So we, we can practice that way too, you know, so some, some arcs are long and some arcs are short. So at the retreat, sometimes we do short ones and sometimes we do long ones. Um, it depends upon the quality of the student. Newcomers, you know, probably, okay, just keep it short so you don't get psychotic, but um, the need, the real life is what we're training for. Do you agree? Hands up, real life is what we're training for. Yeah. So um, it, it doesn't come in neat little packages. 
you know, so you might have to stay with someone for a long period of time, or you might need to train to stay with yourself or someone else for a shorter period of time. You need to train to both like that. So, um, yeah. Question. Oh, la, la. Can I ask a question? Well, right, right. Um, it's a little bit different, but when I was um, at a Kagyu Center in Dallas, the teacher there had us start with sort of like listening to things, like listening to the birds and the dogs. It was a different, obviously, it's not, it wasn't shamatha, but for people who were inexperienced at sitting for any length of time, it was a way to kind of hold still. Mm -hmm. Do you see any value in that? I mean, I know we're we're being asked to do something different, but would that be something people could experiment with? I'm not necessarily saying something totally different. You know, that's um, most people are out of their minds, meaning they're out of their senses. So, so much of meditation is is returning. You know, waking up to our senses. Right, come to your senses, man. You know, it's just yeah, you know, you're hearing things and you're feeling the earth and you know, that's why outdoor retreats are very popular, like with Mark Coleman and people like that, because people are so in their heads and they're looking at their screens all the time and so forth. So, um, so much of the traditional Dharma stuff is very sensually rich, right? You know, people are singing songs and making drums and lighting incense, and it's, it's very sensate grounding. Um, so, you know, those kind of things are important. You know, that's one way to get started. And sometimes we get obviously too rigid and um, then we just need to kind of just listen to birds, don't we? So, however, if you don't, um, if you don't have a discipline, you, you won't attain some of the results. You just can't kind of, you can't have it through just a reverie. Reveries. You just kind of let things drift in and out and not attach them and call that the American mindfulness movement, you know, just, just be present, you know, try from headspace, just let the thoughts come up like blooms and let them know the way. I mean, that, that's good because we're all freaking stressed and crazed, but um, that, that won't allow you to have the energy to work with difficult situations. You'll be training yourself to like as long as everything's fine, then we'll be fine, right? But we have to train to, like, real shit happens. So there's a lot of American privilege, you know. We, we're generally, we're taking refuge and we got a bank account and we're not being bombed and the lights are on and we've got medical care, you know. It's shitty, but we got it. And, you know, so, so... We, we have to train for samsara. We have to train for really difficult things. Because um, we're usually training to comfort, honestly. How can we become more comfortable, <laughs> not be so neurotic? So um, I like to be comfortable too. I mentioned I like my ninth bed, but I'm not I'm not trying to train to comfort. It's It's so insidious, you know. We, trained to Dharma club. We just want to be around comfortable people who aren't annoying. And, but with people that are in deep trauma, not ready to do formal training, then we have to, we do have to make people comfortable and, you know, settled in and get tons of support, right? Because the actual, most of the concentration, all the concentration awareness practices are challenging. They're all challenging. They're meant to go right to your precious self, right? So, you know, they're, they're, they're meant like Carl Brunholz said, a bunny tax sutra, <laughs> right? Sutra art, a tax sutra. So it's, it's quite, um, you know, challenging that way. As long as, as long as we're having, I might mean like I own the experience, then, then we're trapped, right? So, you got enlightened, whatever that is, you saw the nature of mind, or you can do the long, and nobody, nobody noticed, would you be okay with that? Particularly going home to a partner and, you know, I, you know, they just 
months ago, he came back from three year retreat or three month or three week, and um, he still didn't squeeze out the fucking sponge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, I know she's still getting angry. Right. So we have we have to be careful that we're training to real life. One last question, then we gotta go. When somebody hasn't asked or made a comment before, you could say like, I just kind of say I don't get any of this. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Um, that's good. Then, then that means everyone agrees. And no problem. Okay. Well, I have a question about my disability. Yeah. I can't sit. Uh, so it's very difficult. And um, I don't, I usually lie down and, and meditate. Yeah. 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 Lion's posture. That hurts. Yeah, just lying down. Lying down. Elbows hurt. Backs hurt. Just lie down. Yeah, just lie down. Okay. Thank yeah. You. There's okay. a famous uh, maybe some of you saw that. Who's the famous Mindrel Ling Rinpoche who had, and you know just sleeping? Yeah, what was his name? I don't. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, so when I was studying with Churchill Rinpoche in Fairfax, you know, we went to see him, and even he was kind of skeptical. Like it's true, like he'd be sleeping, and then you go wake him up, and then he gets some teachings, and then he goes back to sleep. You know, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's many, you know, people are extraordinary. Yeah. So we know, you know, there's no fixed way to do it. Oh, okay. Oh, la. Would I be able to kind of ask a quick question? Okay. If we're struggling with shamatha and we only focus on our breath, is that a good object to focus on? Or are there other objects that we should try to practice with? So your breath movement is really important because it's always with us. So when you say breath, I usually mean your breath rhythm. But... um. Classical Asian style, it's it's much easier to have a beautiful altar and and do you know the Jorko you know set up and just sit in front of the altar and take the blessings. You see, to really familiarize. So, Chamata is very uh, demanding. So you first want to fill up, right? So if you the prayers or the meditations are generally to fill us up, right? Not to be perfect. So you fill up and then then you just, oh, that's uh, smell the incense, wonderful, a lot beautiful. And then you just sit there on that, you know, make it, make it easy. So it isn't like, okay, I know I got to do this thing. Yeah, I can't, that, you don't want that. So... You know, I'm, I'm talking to educated people here. Everyone's had meditative experience. So we know that you don't want to be too tight or too loose, right? Yeah. It's easy. Mm. So we we have potluck lunch, if that's how. You're going to join us. People can join. And Kala Chakra, 2 o'clock. Correct. Thank you for dialing in, everybody. So, probably Thank you. Some, some of these instructions landed, you know, where they're supposed to land, like that. Mm -hmm. So, the effort, though, is important. Last word. What are the Buddha's last words? Say it louder. Matthew, say it louder. Practice diligently.
right effort and everything like so I had the fortunate honor to see Dr. Memshe several times. They already knew great um Durham Shea himself in a sense in person. And said it's the effort that counts. Didn't say be smart, right? Get the joke. Effort. Bodhicitta, well, you know, it's like it's the leap. Everyone's going, what's the leap? What's what's the leap? What's the leap in Mahamudra? What's the leap? What's the leap? The, the love's the leap, right? It's easy. Sorry, your child's over there. <laughs> your child's over there. You know, there's forest fire or something, or earthquake, and are you just going to go, well, it's too far to jump. No, you're going to take the leap, right? So, you know, it's that when you see effort, it isn't, it's the leap, right? So you talk about, you know, crossing over or spontaneous presence, you know, you, you know it's fully committed leap, right? You can't just kind of, well, I, I'll jump halfway and hopefully make it. No, if you're you're looking for your child or you're trying to help someone, you're you're just taking the leap, right? Like that. So the effort. So when Dujim Rinpoche was talking, it wasn't the, the go do this thing. <laughs> no, it's, it's, yeah, you know, uh, Trungpa Rinpoche used to say, jump the gun, like that. Take take the leap. Isn't that so? Am I making it up, Dirk? What, am I making this up? How, how, have I said anything against that's contrary to the lineage? Speak up now, you know, we have Mahamudra Dzogchen practitioners here. Okay, let's let's do closing prayers. <laughs> Go for it. Everyone knows. Okay, due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of the Guru Buddha. 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 And lead all living beings to that exception and to that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel of Bodhicitta that has not arisen arise as well. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. And the land of the circle by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Jemmy's needs has been got so please remain until some song of ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholdings of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of the stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing and unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Mandrushi, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Songkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losan Drakpa, and make request at your holy feet. Well, thank you for my long life prayer. People should know, like, long life prayer, it has a lot of aspect of you, my true teacher, earthly, but, you know, like, you know, one of my main teachers, Chodin Ramshay, gave me the long life prayer, which most people don't know is a little bit of like commitment, right? Do people know anything about long life prayers? Probably not. So, so now I have to take rebirth somewhere. You can't, I can't say, well, I'm just leaving. That That's what you're doing to a teacher. You know, that's why you do the long life prayers for the teacher. Like you, you do the Tibetan guilt trap. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that, kind of, that's that's the long, you know, that's the long life. You know, you're you're extending, you know, lifetimes ahead. You're not, but you know. So some teachers like the 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 Dujim Rinpoche that went into Parinirvana just last year, right? So of course we're still praying for long life, right? So just because he left early. You know, it doesn't mean he was um, not committed to the long life prayers. Because sometimes people say they do kind of guilting, Dharma guilt, like your prayers weren't strong enough. And that's, do you hear that? Your prayers weren't strong enough so the teacher got sick or the prayers weren't strong enough. So 
the teacher didn't stay around, you know, if you've been in some sanghas, they, they guilt trip it, you know, but, um, it, you know, what, what, it's a deeper level of guilt tripping and saying you have to, you have to come, <laughs> not really guilt tripping, but, you know, it's an aspiration, like, please come back and we'll come back too, right? So, you know, like, so, I said to Jada Rimshi last time I was here, I said, well, I need to talk about how to get back to Sacramento. You know, I was going, oh, no, we're talking about it now. <laughs> no, we got a lot of work to do, so I'm still pretty, pretty healthy. But then, you know, thinking, coming back to Sacramento, you know, that's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah, so... Usually when my teacher asked me to stay in Sacramento, I said, I don't want to stay in Sacramento. There's nothing happening here. But now it's happening, isn't it? It's true, totally. A lot of good Dharma in Sacramento from all kinds of places. Okay, so stay for lunch. Thank you. Oh,